When we talked about electrolytes last time, I mentioned that you guys have heard of electrolytes, of course, before, in regards to Gatorade. Why does Gatorade contain electrolytes? Ooh, that was a rhetorical question. You must have to answer that. Now, speaking of that, Dalton, you run marathons, Dalton? No, you are. Let's say Dalton's running the Lake City Marathon. So he's, uh, he's running along, it's 26 miles total, so he's running along for about 10 miles, he gets really thirsty, because after running for 10 miles, he's drenched with sweat. And you guys know what sweat tastes like, it's salty. Turns out when you sweat, you're not only losing water, you are losing salt, which is a big electrolyte, the most major one in your body. So Shelby, to be helpful, she's waiting at the 10 mile long marker, and she gives you a nice, cool glass of distilled water. You're really nice, aren't you? So Dalton chugs down his cool distilled water, runs another few miles, and uh, Shelby jumped in her car, drove a few miles ahead to meet him, and she once again, after a few more miles, hands him a nice, chilled glass of distilled water. So Dalton runs a few more steps, collapses, and dies. <laughs> Why? Well, when you sweat, you lose not just water, you, use elect you lose electrolytes. And why are electrolytes important to your body? Well, everybody raise your hand. Raise your hand. Good. How did you do that? Nervous system. What does that mean? Your brain sent a signal to your muscles, causing them to contract. What kind of signal do you think that was? Electrical. How did that electrical signal get conducted from your brain to your muscles? Electro Electrolytes. Oh. There you go. What were you going to say? Electrolytes, anyway. So there's the problem. So Dalton has been sweating out not only water, but electrolytes. And since he's only been replacing the water part, what happens is his uh, brain sends a signal to his legs to keep running. The, the leg muscles don't get that signal, so he falls flat on his face. <laughs> Then the brain sends a signal to the heart to keep beating. That signal doesn't get there either, so he dies. His heart stops beating. That was Shelby's plan all along. Wow. That's the idea behind Gatorade. So the idea behind Gatorade is when you're exercising, you want to not just replace the water you're losing, but also the electrolytes you're losing as well. How do you drink Gatorade? None of you guys are athletes. You don't need Gatorade at all. In fact, the problem with Gatorade is, yeah, it's got some electrolytes in it, but it's also got weird fluorescent food coloring. I always think of that commercial where the guy's like sweating, dripping fluorescent orange goo out of him. I'm not sure how that's supposed to be appetizing. But anyway, it's full of fluorescent dyes, full of sugar, it's nasty. Don't drink Gatorade. It's just nonsense. What you should be drinking if you're running a marathon would be... Lake City Tap Water. Lake City Tap Water. There you go. You can drink orange juice too, and professional marathon runners actually have special electrolyte powders they mix with water to drink. You guys, none of you guys are athletes at all, I'm sure. And you guys who eat french fries and pizza, so you get all the electrolytes you would ever need and a lot more. So don't, you don't need to drink Gatorade, unless you really like it. It's awful. Well, that's just my personal opinion. So anyway, that's what electrolytes are all about. Now in terms of chemistry, here is where electrolytes come important in uh, terms of chemistry. We're going to do a new reaction today. This new reaction we're going to talk about today is the double displacement reaction, which is sometimes called the precipitation reaction. which is also sometimes called a metathesis reaction. All three of those names mean the same reaction, which I'm going to usually call the double displacement reaction, except when I know. Turns out, whatever you want to call this reaction, this reaction has to meet certain criteria. First off, we have to have two electrolyte reactants. <coughs> and when those two electrolyte reactants go together, they're going to form at least one non-electrolyte product. 
If this fits, then we have a successful double displacement reaction or precipitation reaction or metathesis reaction. Let's see this in action. Let's say we mix together these two reactants. So first off, we have to establish that both of these reactants are electrolytes. Remember the three criteria for that. So one, they have to be composed of cations and anions. Two, they have to be water soluble. And three, an aqueous solution of these materials must conduct electricity. But we can dispense with step three because we know if they're composed of cations and anions and water soluble, then a solution will conduct electricity. So we don't have to worry about step three. In fact, we don't even have to worry about step one, really, because all the chemicals we're seeing in Gen Chem 1 are composed of cations and anions. So it all boils down to water solubility. Is KCl here, potassium chloride, water soluble? If only you had some sheet to tell you that information. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. How many of you were slackers and forgot to bring the solubility table on? Nah. Oops. Well, look how Zona does, I guess. Go you use your textbook. Didn't bring that either, did you? So anyone want to answer this? Is potassium chloride water soluble? Yes. Yes, it is. That's an easy one because it's got a group one cation, potassium. So that means it's got to be water soluble. And we'll indicate that with a little aqueous there. We've already seen these, so S is solid, L is liquid, G is gas, and AQ is aqueous. Now all of a sudden these become very important. Aqueous there means it's water soluble, and therefore it's an electrolyte. What about silver one nitrate? Is that water soluble? Yes it is. That's the next rule. So it is a nitrate, and all nitrates are water soluble. So, so far, so good. We have two electrolyte reactants, so maybe we have a successful double displacement reaction. Now we need to predict exactly what products we can make here. To do that, we've got to look at our two reactants, and in each case, see what cation and anion make them up. So potassium chloride contains a K plus cation and a Cl minus anion, and silver one nitrate, has an Ag plus cation and a nitrate polyatomic anion. So how do you predict the products of a reaction like this? Well, it's just like a swing 70s sex party. Everybody's going to swap partners. <laughs> there, so now our K plus is going to be paired with the nitrate. And our Ag plus is going to be paired with the chloride. This is a heterosexual swing 70 sex party, so it has to be cations and anions pairing together. Now that we got these new pairings, we've got to come up with reasonable chemical formulas. K has a 1 plus charge, NO3 minus is a 1 minus charge. So here is one of our two potential products KNO3 potassium nitrate. In our other product, we have Ag1+, plus, Cl1-, minus. they two go together one to one. And so our other potential product is silver 1 chloride, AgCl. There. Now that we have predicted what our potential products could be, now we can go back and balance our chemical equation. Or do we need to? It is balanced. We have one K on each side, one chloride on each side, one silver on each side. And notice that since nitrate actually appears on both sides, we don't have to break that down into nitrogens and oxygens. We can just say we've got one nitrate in the reactant side, one nitrate in the product side. So our equation is balanced. And now for the moment of truth. Remember to have a successful reaction here, we have to make at least one non-electrolyte product. So get your solubility table back out again. First off, potassium nitrate. Is that water soluble? Yes. yes, it is. Both because it's got a group one cation and it's a nitrate. So kind of a double whammy there. Definitely water soluble. 
What about silver one chloride? <coughs> it is not. Most chlorides are water soluble, but Ag plus is one of the exceptions. And when we get a non-electrolyte material here, we're going to label that for or with S for solid. And if you do this reaction in lab, and you will tomorrow in lab, what's going to happen is this. You'll take these two solutions, potassium chloride and silver one nitrate. When you mix them together, what will happen is a powder will form in solution. First of all, first off, it'll look cloudy, and then gradually <coughs> that cloudiness will settle out as a powder at the bottom of your test tube. That powder would be that solid non-electrolyte. And that's why one of the names for this reaction is precipitation reaction. Because when you mix these chemicals together, it's like snow or precipitation coming out of the solution and settling down to the bottom. Metathesis is kind of hard to explain. It's just the third name for this reaction. All right. So this here was a successful double displacement or precipitation or metathesis reaction. Let's try another one. Uh, depends. It's uh, often clear, sometimes colored, but it would be transparent. Light's going to shine through it. There are no solids in there. All right, what will be another good one about this? So another potential double displacement reaction, our first step is determine if these are both electrolytes. So what's the word? What about this one? This is iron 3 bromide. Is this water soluble? Yes it is. So the rule says that most bromides are water soluble and iron 3 plus is not one of the exceptions. So it is an electrolyte. So we'll label it AQ for aqueous. Our next uh, starting material here, our next reactant is sodium sulfate. Is that water soluble? Yep. Sodium is a group 1 cation, so definitely water soluble. So we've got an uh, acceptable setup here. Now what we need to do next is divide our reactants into their constituent cations and anions. And this right here is where most people make mistakes when it comes to these double displacement reactions. Looking at our iron 3 bromide here, our cation is iron 3 plus. When I break the reactants down into their constituent cations and anions though, all I'm looking for here is what type of cation and what type of anion we have. So iron, having a 3 plus charge, it has to have 3 Br minuses attached to it to neutralize its charge. However, the type of anion is simply Br minus. A big mistake people will make in problems like this is they'll think there's some significance to there being 3 Brs here, and so they'll invent some funky new polyatomic structure like that. Have you ever seen that? Oh, it's for like each individual. Each individual one. So you've never seen that, right? Br3, 3 minus? You've never seen that because it doesn't exist. You just made something up. So be careful. If you find yourself making some bizarre polyatomic structure, you're almost certainly wrong. Just stick with what you know. So our anion here is just plain old Br minus. We needed three of them to balance out the iron, but we don't care about that. Same deal in our second reactant. What is our cation here? What type of cation do we have? It's just Na+. We needed two of them to balance out the negative two charge on the sulfate. But we don't care about that. Don't make weird polyatomic structures here. All we're looking for is what type of cation, what type of anion we have in each of our two reactants. And now we're going to swap partners. Always remember that cations first, anions second, always. 
Our new combination here is going to be Na plus and Br minus. What would be a reasonable chemical formula for that? NaBr. 1 plus and 1 minus. A little bit trickier over here, though, because we've got an iron 3 plus and a sulfate 2 minus. Once again, that uh, least common multiple of 6 pops up. So if we had two irons here, we'd have six positive charges, three sulfates, we'd have six negatives. So that's what we need to do here. So that would be iron three sulfate. There. Now that we've figured out the structures for our products, we can now, and only now, try to balance the chemical equation. And since our polyatomic anion sulfate is staying intact in this reaction, we can simply balance it as a sulfate. We've got one <laughs> iron here, three BRs, two sodiums, and one sulfate on the reactant side. Product side, two irons, one BR, one sodium, and three sulfates. <coughs> so what about balancing this? Well notice we uh, need two irons. So I'll change this invisible one coefficient here to a two. Now I've got two irons on each side, but I've also messed with the bromines, we now have six of them. Moving next to the bromines, we do have six in the reactant side. And by changing the invisible one to a six, we now have six in the product side as well. But I've now messed with the sodiums. We now have six of those as well. We only have two sodiums over here, so I have to change this invisible one to a three. Now I've got six sodiums in the reactant side. But I've also messed with the sulfates. We now have three. We're done. There. That was a lot of work, wasn't it? Now, after all that work, will this reaction even work? Well, let's look at the solubility table. What about sodium bromide? Is that water soluble? Yes. Yes, it is. It's got a group one cation. What about iron three sulfate? It too is water soluble. Like most sulfates, it's water soluble. Iron 3 was not an exception. So, after all that work, this reaction will not even work. We just wasted our time. Isn't that nice? Now, how do we summarize our results here? Well, here's how we do it we are not actually going to make these products if we mix iron 3 bromide and sodium sulfate together. If we mix those two solutions together, we will simply end up with a mixture of iron 3 bromide and sodium sulfate in solution, which means we have no reaction. And in chemistry, we just indicate that with a big NR, no reaction. We do have to have at least one non-electrolyte product to have a successful reaction here. We can first get rid of our coefficients here as well, because they are no longer valid. Let's try another one. This time I'll let you guys try this one on your own. Remember all the steps here. So first off, we have to establish that both of these reactants are electrolytes. Then we'll have to split each one into its constituent cations and anions. But remember, we just want what type of cation and what type of anion. We don't want to actually try to balance anything at this point and don't make any weird polyatomic structures. Then switch partners to see what your products are going to look like. Make valid formulas for your products. Then balance the equation. And then finally, by consulting your solubility chart, determine if you've made at least one non-electrolyte product.